So I'm uh, introduce the introducer, but I'm going to take the uh, prerogative. I have to say a few words about the man he's going to introduce as well, uh, because he's an old friend of mine. Uh, we spent a lot of time together, uh, both during the campaign of 2007 and 8, and and during the White House uh, period. And uh, uh, Jake's an exceptional reporter, and an incredibly a bright guy. But I was blown away, frankly that knowing how hard he worked uh, in the White House and on that campaign, that he was working on this book project uh, at the same time. And uh, I hope you all read the book. It's an important book. Um, one of the things that struck me, when I was traveling with the president, um, uh, we went to Afghanistan and we went to Iraq, met these splendid young people. But it struck me that how remote the war was, uh, how little Americans uh, were thinking about the war because it was over there. Um, uh, if it wasn't their children, um, uh, then um, it was not that they didn't care, but it just wasn't on the uh, radar screen. And uh, so when works like Jake's come along and bring in, in vivid relief uh, the extraordinary sacrifices that uh, these young people are making and their families uh, back home, uh, I think it's very, very important for us to uh, pay attention and understand what the cost of war uh, truly is. So with that, let me uh, introduce Aiden Mil Mildiff, right? Mildiff? Did I do it right? No, Mil Milliff. Milliff, thank you. Let's see, trained professional over here. So uh, you, he got it right, you got it right. Um, Jake, by the way, is, uh, his, his, uh, comes from uh, the union of Hyde Parkers, right? A couple right. of Hyde Parkers, yeah. right? Which is why he immediately leaped in there to make sure that he was the guy who was right on the name thing. So <laughs> it's like a Hyde Park thing. Anyway, uh, uh, Aiden is a third year student in the college in uh, political science with a focus on international relations. He's a managing editor for The Gate, which is our new uh, uh, site for political uh, commentary. Uh, uh, and uh, he is the Undersecretary General of the Model UN, so the absolutely appropriate guy to make the introduction tonight, Aiden. Thank you, David. Uh, Jake Tapper's made a career of asking tough questions and uh, finding buried leads in the news. And during his 15 years in DC journalism, he's found the untold stories. He covered gun violence in DC in the wake of the Columbine tragedy in Colorado. Uh, he examined the political motives at hand in the 2000 presidential election when everyone else was watching the recount. Uh, for three years as ABC's White House correspondent, he uh, broke major stories like tax problems that derailed Tom Daschle's nomination for the Secretary of Health and Human Services. And he uh, broke the news in 2011 that Standard & Poor was expected to downgrade the rating of U.S. debt. He's contributed to Emmy and Peabody winning broadcasts. He's been thrice honored with the Merriman Smith Award by the White House Correspondents Association. And he's now CNN's chief Washington correspondent and the anchor of his own show uh, weekdays on CNN, The Lead with Jake Tapper. During all this, uh, as David mentioned, he's continued to find the untold stories, and he's continued to ask the same difficult questions, not least in his most recent book, The Outpost, A Story of American Valor, where he describes one of the deadliest days in the Afghan conflict. So the premise of The Outpost raises some questions in return to his. What compelled a rising star in Washington uh, to focus on a war thousands of miles away? What does it mean to go from asking questions to Robert Gibbs in the White House press briefing room to transcribing the words of soldiers like Staff Sergeant Clinton Romache and Staff Sergeant Ty Carter, both Medal of Honor recipients, as they talked about eight fellow soldiers who uh, died at combat, combat outpost Keating? And perhaps most importantly, why were these soldiers there in the first place? So here with all the answers, CNN's chief Washington correspondent and uh, the author of The Outpost, Mr. Jake Tapper. Very nice, very nice introduction. Should be proud of that guy. Uh, it's really great to be here. Um, uh, as David noted, uh, I have uh, Chicago roots. My dad's from Hyde Park. My grandfather, we think, 
was class of 26 at the University of Chicago and 29 maybe from Chicago Law. Uh, my grandmother uh, went to Northwestern, sorry. Um, and uh, I love coming to this town even though I am a Philadelphian. Uh, uh, my dad is Chicago through and through. He met uh, David one time when I was filling in for George uh, Stephanopoulos on This Week. David was uh, the guest. Uh, and my dad was there uh, as a proud papa, but he was also very excited to meet a, a fellow Chicagoan. Uh, the greatest thing I ever did for David was not to give my dad David's uh, email address. Um, I can assure you that is, that is something that, you're, that you'll, you're happy about for the rest of your days. One word about David. Um, I interviewed Rahm Emanuel today, Mayor Emanuel, and uh, seeing David here uh, reminds me of how, uh, how great President Obama's A-team was when he started, um, a bunch of tough guys who had good relationships uh, with, uh, with Capitol Hill, uh, with reporters. Um, I squabbled with all of them, uh, David and Rom and Robert Gibbs. I guess we need to, I need to give a speech at the Gibbs Center for moonshine and soccer sometime to uh, <laughs> round out the trifecta, but uh, I do think President Obama, um, whether he knows it or not, misses these three guys uh, quite a bit. Um, and one of the things about David is that um, he was, there, there was just always an equanimity about him. Um, I, I know I was a pain, uh, as was my job, uh, covering, no, although not, it always, it wasn't always part of the job when I was a pain, but uh, uh, he was always there to, uh, to answer the questions and to help a reporter and help the president. And I think one thing that a lot of people who work in politics forget is that they are vessels for whomever they're working. By being helpful and nice and smart and not a liar, David was doing a tremendous amount of service for the man he was trying to help, then Senator and now President Obama. Uh, and that's just something for people who go into politics to remember um, that you are an extension of the person you're, you're serving when you are serving in that, in that role. Now, that, that is David anyway. That is his personality anyway. But President Obama um, is a lot of wonderful things. I don't know that Hamisha would ever apply to him necessarily, but um, uh, he was helped by the fact that David was such a mensch. And uh, I just I wanted to, to thank you for that. Um, another thing I've learned from David is uh, when you marry way out of your league, uh, worship the warm woman as much as you can. And that is, uh, that is something that David does and I have learned from his example, uh, having also married out of my league. Uh, so please tell Susan I say hi. Um, so to, to answer some of the questions uh, raised, um, it, it was an unusual topic for me to begin uh, writing a book about. And the reason I wrote a book about Afghanistan uh, had less to do, I felt, um, with me picking Combat Outpost Keating than in a way Combat Outpost Keating picking me. Um, I almost feel like a bystander in how I came to this story. Um, my son was born, my son Jack was born on October 2nd, 2009. One day later, October 3rd, 2009, uh, was the attack. And I sat in the hospital room holding my son, watching reports on CNN, um, about um, eight other sons taken from this earth. And the coverage of the combat outpost Keating was very accurate. It was a lot of disbelief by people in the military and by family members and the media. Why would anybody put an outpost at the bottom of three steep mountains? Why would you have an outpost with only 53 US soldiers in a place so close to the Pakistan border? On October 3rd, 2009, the 53 U.S. troops there uh, and two Latvians and a, a few dozen Afghan troops woke up uh, and they, were, they faced overwhelming odds, an unbelievable attack by up to 400 Taliban, all of whom had um, the advantage of, of uh, the, the um, not the low road, but the high road. Um, and what struck me was I wanted to know why anybody would, the high ground, I'm sorry, not the high, the high road, the high ground. And what struck me was I always wanted to know, well, why did anybody, why would they put an outpost there? That just seems dumb. I'm not, you know, Schwarzkopf, and I know you don't put a, an outpost at the bottom of three steep mountains. Um, and um, no one ever told me. No one ever told me why that happened. And I, I waited for an answer. 
and the military um, journalists uh, who I think do a great job um, for whatever reason, maybe the outpost was so remote or for whatever reason, no one ever wrote a story about it. The Army did an internal investigation, but uh, typically they confined the investigation to just the few months before the attack and the day of the attack without looking at the whole history of the outpost. It was built in 2006. Surely at some point somebody thought this was a good idea. Um, and so I waited and waited and nobody ever did it and eventually I started calling reporter, uh, calling soldiers, um, as a reporter does when he has questions or she has questions and nobody's answering them. So I started calling soldiers who had served there. They got back uh, May or June of 2010. And they didn't know why the outpost was there, um, but they were eager to talk. Um, they were willing to talk and they wanted their stories told. They wanted um, their eight uh, fallen brothers uh, memorialized. They wanted people to, they wanted someone to tell their story. They felt like nobody, they felt like they had, they had suffered through the deadliest, bloodiest day for U.S. troops in 2009, and nobody back here knew about it, and nobody back here cared. So the fact that I called, they were uh, fairly hospitable to. Um, eventually, after um, getting enough information and, and putting together a book pitch, I, I, sold, I sold the book deal to... Little Browning Company. Um, I'd written a book for them a decade before um, about the Florida recount. And then something extraordinary happened, which is after, like I said, I kinda, it kind of felt like Cop Keating, Combat Outpost Keating picked me to write it. And it, sounds, um, it sounds like a, a narcissistic almost, but I don't mean, I just mean like I, it's so random that, I just, that this thing stuck in my craw. I think one of the reasons it did, um, looking back on it, because you know you have these life-altering moments and you don't necessarily realize it at the time until you look back and you say, oh, that's the moment I fell out of love with that person or whatever. Um, and I think one of the reasons it did is because I had covered war a little bit. I had, I had done two or three weeks in the ABC News Baghdad Bureau in 2005, um, and I had covered the war in Afghanistan from the comfort of the North Lawn of the White House. I'd covered the war um, in terms of the debate going on as President Obama conducted his Afghanistan-Pakistan review. Uh, how many troops were gonna surge? 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, 40,000. They bandied about these numbers. I bandied about these numbers like they were sports scores or something on a stock ticker. And, and uh, without really reporting or realizing in my brain what each one of those numbers meant. I also covered the politics of what was going on at the time, the, the f squabbles between the Pentagon and the White House, uh, the disputes as Joe Biden pushed for um, a smaller presence, counterterrorism troops mainly, um, and others pushed for a bigger, uh, robust uh, troop presence in, uh, for what's called counterinsurgency or coin, which for want of a better term is, is basically nation building, building up a village so that people in the village support the US and they and ultimately end up pushing out the Taliban and pursuing a way of life in which they are bonded with the Afghan government. And so I was covering this politics also, but again, that completely ignores um, what the people who actually fight these wars and their family members, as David points out, who sacrifice so much, what they go through, um, and I think that because I was covering the war in such a Washington superficial glib way, um, and because I had been part of the Washington reporter scene in which people on the right and left call for troops to be involved um, rather glibly, uh, and I had let them do that or I had been part of it myself, whether it's people on the right who want to spread a freedom and liberty agenda and want troops to go places, or people on the left who believe in humanitarian intervention and want to stop massacres and they're calling for troop intervention. I think that there is a glibness uh, with which we talk about, not people in the military, but those of us who are not in the military, the 99% of us who don't have anything to do with war except reading about it. Uh, in the newspaper or watching it on TV, as opposed to the 1% who bear all of the sacrifice and all of um, the service uh, for the rest of us. So as I started reporting this, 
Um, and as combat outpost Keating, in my view, felt like picked me, then all of a sudden, once the decision has been made and the book, had, the book contract was signed, then all these troops started reaching out to me. All these soldiers who had been there not in 2009 when there was the big attack, but had been there in previous years. In 2006, uh, Ross Burkhoff, uh, captain, intelligence um, officer, who wanted me to know why they went there, why they set up the outpost there. And he wanted me to know about who Ben Keating was. Ben Keating, the camp is named after him. And he was killed because he was driving a truck on the very, very narrow roads that they have in that part of Afghanistan, on these mountains that are part of the Hindu Kush. And the truck rolled over, and he was killed. It was just one of the lessons I learned about how incredibly dangerous the terrain in Afghanistan is, and sometimes much more dangerous and deadly and certainly more omnipresent than the enemy. And so Ross reached out, and then I was like, okay, so I'll, I'll write about a little bit. I'll have a chapter about Ben Keating at the start of the book. But then Ben, it, it, um, Ross wanted me to know um, about Buddy Huey, who was an Oklahoma National Guardsman who was training Afghan soldiers, and in February 2007 uh, was in a firefight and saw a wounded Afghan soldier and ran out to save that Afghan soldier as if he was one of his own soldiers, an American soldier, and was killed trying to do that. He wanted me to know about Buddy. Um, and he wanted me to know about his commander, Lieutenant Colonel Joe Fenty, who was killed in a helicopter crash because the terrain was so dangerous and the helicopter came down and it hit a tree and 10 Americans were killed in 2006, a helicopter crash I have no memory of hearing about or reading about at all. And in fact, when I went online, I couldn't find much written about it at all. Um, and then troops from 2007 started reaching out to me. They were there 2007 to 2008, and they had had successes. They had been able to forge relationships uh, with the local Afghans, and they had been able to beat back the enemy, and they wanted me to know that this wasn't just a stupid operation, and there, it wasn't that um, what was going on in 2009 was the same that had been going on in 2007, that, that they had made a difference there for the short time they were there, and that they had lost brothers like their commander, Captain Tom Bostick, uh, or Private uh, Chris Pfeiffer. And then the guys from 2008, 2009 reached out and they wanted me to know about Captain Rob Bieskis, their commander who had been assassinated by the Taliban uh, by a remote control uh, IED. And pretty soon I had a much more ambitious project than I had planned on writing. Uh, I had planned on writing about one battle and ultimately what I had was um, three and a half years worth of experiences uh, and um, I felt a burden, a, a responsibility to tell these stories. And it was very humbling um, to spend time with these people, to spend time with the men and women uh, who served at Combat Outpost Keating and the men and women who had lost loved ones at Combat Outpost Keating or had lost limbs. Um, it was very humbling to become part of, of their community in the small way I did because it made me realize, it made me feel like I, had, I was worthless and I had spent so much time in my life just pursuing my own uh, self-aggrandization and, uh, and, and sacrificing nothing and giving nothing back to the country and, um, or the nation that had done so much for uh, me. And I said to my wife, I came back from drinks one time with Dave Roller and Alex Newsom who's still in the army, Dave Roller, Dave Roller left, he's in law school now. And I came back from drinks and I, I just told my wife, I'm like, I am such a piece of crud. Um, I, I was more graphic than that, but, but, uh, but uh, I'm just like, I, you know, I just, uh, I've sacrificed absolutely nothing for anybody uh, and that's all these people do. Uh, and they are paid a fraction of what I make and I haven't spent any time thinking about them. My grandfather fought in World War II. He lost his little brother, um, my Uncle Edwin, fighting in World War II. But basically, I have no connection to the military whatsoever. I remember the first Iraq war breaking out uh, when I was a senior, and it didn't mean anything to me at all. I had finals, I think. Um, and there were some peace protesters on campus um, making body bags, and none of it meant anything to me. Um, and I realized that, uh, well, I said that to my wife, I'm such a piece of crud. And she said, but you can, she didn't disagree with the assessment, but she said, uh, you can tell their stories. You can tell their stories. Um, that's what you can do. Um, and so that's what I tried to do in writing this book. Um, and 
Uh, it was a very emotionally uh, draining experience, and when people ask me if I'm going to do another one, I can't imagine it at all uh, because it is such a commitment. But my wife was incredible, and she understood that it became something more than a book project to me, and it was something that, you know, I would spend time on the phone uh, or in person uh, or Skyping or emailing with people who were sharing very, very personal um, and very uh, heartfelt um, memories with me, and it's very, um, it's very uh, otherworldly to be talking to somebody who you know is much tougher than you are, and he is in tears uh, remembering something. And for a lot of these guys, as with World War II veterans, it's right there, it's right there, thinking about whatever it is that there is causing them pain, losing a friend. Um, some positive things have come from the experience beyond, obviously, uh, and I think uh, most of the troops that participated in the book, and I interviewed more than 225 people, um, are happy that somebody was telling their story. But beyond that, a couple um, things that really, I think, were incredible. One is, um, this year, for the first time since 1968, so a year before I was born, um, a Two living U.S. service members were honored uh, with the Medal of Honor for actions during the same battle. That has not happened since 1968, and that happened with uh, Clint Romache and Ty Carter, who were in that battle on October 3rd, 2009. Uh, President Obama awarded them both the Medal of Honor, uh, and it was exciting to uh, play a small part in it. Not that I had anything to do with the medals, but once I found out about them, uh, to throw a party for Clint and his men, uh, to interview them both. Uh, I, I left ABC for CNN in January, and I'm really glad I did for a number of reasons, but one of them is CNN is a 24-hour news network. Uh, ABC News is a great place, but it's, it's an entertainment channel with, with a news division. And because uh, of what CNN is, Jeff Zucker, the uh, new CEO, said, I said, I know Clint Romache was the first one to be, get the medal. But I'm like, I know Clint. I can, we can go out to North Dakota. We can get the first interview with him. Give me an hour to do the documentary, and we'll do a whole thing about combat outpost Keating. It's an incredible story. And he said, go do it. Go do it. And we, we did a documentary about Clint. We did a documentary about Ty. Um, and uh, it was just very, it, it, was, it was very nice to see them recognized, um, not only by a few book sales, but also by um, the commander in chief. Uh, to recognize what they did. The last time two people uh, were honored from the same battle um, was Black Hawk Down, and that, those medals of honor were both posthumous. Uh, so this is the first time two living service members were since then. And then the last um, point I'd like to make, and, and the last thing that, that uh, meant something to me, and, and I know more to others, um, and then I'll just open the floor to, to questions, um, is um, there were eight men who were killed that day. Uh, all eight of them were killed. Uh, doing something selfless in one way or another, um, running to give ammunition to somebody on guard duty or returning fire into the mountains or um, looking for a, a brother, all eight of them doing something selfless. But there was a ninth victim of combat outpost Keating um, because my father-in-law asked me why, you know, in your experience, why do people join the military um, based on, you know, now you've met literally hundreds of soldiers, uh, why? And the, the truth is there are any number of reasons um, from a lifetime of, you know, from wanting to serve to being outraged by 9-11 to, um, you know, having family that dates back to the Civil War who served, the Revolutionary War who served, um, to uh, a bunch of guys, and any Army guy will tell you this is true, um, who were screw-ups and ultimately they decided that they were either going to join the military, they were going to probably end up dead or in jail. Uh, and so they joined the military to get their life back in order. Ed Faulkner was probably more of that last group than, than any of the other groups. Uh, he was kind of a pothead. Uh, in, after he was wounded in Iraq, he developed a chemical dependency. I think it was originally to painkillers, but it probably sp spread to other things. Before he deployed in 2009 to Afghanistan, uh, Faulkner's best friend overdosed of meth, on meth, leaving behind a wife and kid. Um, and Faulkner was wounded again during the October 3rd, 2009 battle. Um, and he went back to Colorado to get treatment and um, developed uh, an addiction or redeveloped his addiction again. 
uh, and the army decided ultimately it was better to honorably discharge him then than to dishonorably discharge him later. Um, and that's a decision I know that infuriated Ed Faulkner's dad. Um, but in any case, they made the decision. And before the first anniversary of, nine, of, uh, of the October 3rd attack, uh, Ed Faulkner overdosed on methadone and died. And Ty Carter uh, refers to him as the ninth. I don't know how many of you know what a commander's coin is. I just learned it when I was writing this book. But commander's coins are given out by um, generals and above um, when they think you've done a good job. You don't even, they don't present it to you. They shake your hand and it's in their hand and you take it and you're not supposed to look at it. You're supposed to put it in your pocket and that's the end of that. You've probably gotten a couple of them. The commander in chief has one, um, uh, which is, it's kind of a cool one. And uh, uh, when you're a Medal of Honor uh, recipient, you also get to make your own. And Ty Carter, his has nine guys on it, including Ed Faulkner. And the Faulkners, uh, who felt betrayed by the Army and who felt uh, cheated by what happened to their son, were at the Medal of Honor ceremony for Ty Carter. And they heard President Obama talk about Ty Carter's post-traumatic stress. He will not he will hit me if I call it a disorder. So it's post-traumatic PTS, not PTSD. And Ty Carter is very open and honest about the PTS he has. And President Obama mentioned, uh, and I know it was important to Ty, mentioned Ed Faulkner Jr. Uh, as one of the others who had PTS. And that meant so much to the Faulkners. Uh, and it was just a couple words for President Obama to say, but it meant um, more than words can say to the Faulkners. But more than that, more important is a mission for all of us, and that is conservative estimates would have it that um, 500,000 U.S. troops who served in Afghanistan and Iraq of the 2.5 million, 500,000 of them have some form of PTS uh, or psychological damage. And uh, this is going to be a crisis uh, in the next decade or two as these people try to find their way and make their way into society. And it's an obligation I think we have, all of us, to try to find, uh, make sure that these people know uh, that, first of all, to offer them jobs if we can, but also to make sure uh, that they know we're here, that they know we care, uh, that they know that we don't think what they went through was worth nothing and that we actually appreciate it. Um, and uh, that's an important, that's the lesson of, of Ed Faulkner for me is something that we need to, as we as a society go forward, uh, to keep in mind. Um, so that said, I mean, it was a very moving experience and I'm really, I'm really happy to answer any of your questions. Well, I do want to ask one question before we, we open it up to questions, which is um, talk a little bit about the added, I know that um, service is important to these men do they feel that they that service was uh, was was in a worthy cause? How do they evaluate uh, their service all these years later? Yeah, it's an it's an interesting question, and and one I mean first of all, they're all over the map. I mean uh, one of the things uh, I've learned by now knowing hundreds of these guys is that you know some of them are very very conservative, some of them are very very liberal. I mean you can't you can't stereotype. Um, Generally speaking, I think a lot of them are just of the school that it's not their job to question orders. It's their question to follow orders. It's their, it's their imperative to follow orders. I have asked them, because Combat Outpost Keating, after it was attacked, um, was abandoned. And it was going to be abandoned anyway. It was going to be um, the U.S. was going to leave uh, Combat Outpost Keating anyway. Um, but uh, not in time, obviously. Um, but I, but I, I have asked that question, was it worth it? I mean, do you think you lost eight guys for a piece of real estate that's no longer in our control? Um, which is not new, I mean, that happens in war. Um, but it's, it's rarer that it's in such a precarious and vulnerable place. And they don't, to a man, even though they do have so many different feelings about politics and the war, um, to a man, they don't let themselves ask the question. They acknowledge that I'm, I'm not gonna think about that. I'm not gonna, because to them it's, it's eight guys killed. I mean, eight guys, eight friends, you know, four from one platoon, four from the other platoon, who, who, uh, who they still cry about. I mean, it's one of the remarkable things about interviewing Clint Romache, the former staff sergeant who now works in an oil field in Minot, North Dakota, is uh, he's still kicking himself for the guys he couldn't save that day. I mean, he did braver things than I could imagine doing. Ty Carter, too. 
And all they do is think about, all, they're haunted by, by the, the people they couldn't save. So I think a lot of them can't get to the, was the cause worth it, was it worth it? In terms of the pending US withdrawal of combat troops, I mean, they're all over the map. Some of them are like, it's time to get out of there. We're doing more harm than good being there. Some of them, you know, hate anything that a democratic president does, and so they'll question it no matter what. I, does all the work that you did uh, and all those conversations, did that help shape your own reporting on the war? Did it change your reporting in any way? That's a great question. I, I mean, it made me care about it a lot more. It made me realize I don't have any of the answers, and thank God I don't have to. Uh, it made me, I mean, I, I've said, I said this earlier, and I'll say it, I mean, there's a lot, it's, there's just a lot of glibness with which everyone in Washington, politicians, and certainly the media, treat these men and women. Um, you know, a, as if we know what the right answer is, and, and that if we, if, if Jay Carney doesn't give the right answer, um, he's disgracing the troops. I mean, it's, it's, it's very flip. I, I hope that since I started writing, I hope I didn't do it to begin with, um, but I hope especially since uh, I have not been, I've not fallen into that trap. I will tell you, and then I'll open it up to questions, that having been there during the time when the president was reviewing the Afghanistan strategy and making decisions about uh, what to do, um, there was no glibness about it. Uh, he, it was a very grave uh, exercise because he knew that he was going to be, to the degree he committed more troops, he was going to be committing some number of them to, uh, to death, to, to injury, to psychological scars that will be hard to erase. Uh, I remember when he went to West Point to announce the policy, yeah. and he greeted all these uh, uh, young, young, uh, uh, young people um, after the speech, and he said after, I, I know that some of them won't come back uh, because of a decision that I made. I think uh, that's a profound responsibility and, and one that uh, was, was clearly, clearly uh, something that he thought about a lot. But uh, here we have a question. I will or say, well, or are, you, are you the distributor of the microphone yeah. or are you the questioner? Are you the distributor? The distributor. Okay. I will say before the questioner, I just will just on one note on the politics. There's not a lot of politics in the book. Um, President Obama, President Bush make appearances here and there. Uh, the generals and the secretaries of defense do as well. The, the one time I try to, the, not one time, but the times that you see these individuals, it more has to do with how the decisions they made affected the guys on the ground at combat outpost Keating. Um, and so, so I do try to draw some of those, those lines, but, but uh, it's, not a, it's not a political book. And one of the things that's been so rewarding is to have nice reviews about it. Uh, I've been very lucky with the reviews, um, but, one, but, I, but both Breitbart.com and DailyCoast.com gave a good reviews, which said to me, I, I succeeded in keeping it, yes. ape, keeping it apolitical. Maybe you could handle the budget talk. <laughs> no, let's not go crazy. <laughs> Hi, I'd like to know, um, I saw the CNN shows on this, and there was some combat footage, and it's pretty obvious to understand that the topography of the f fort outpost was really put in a bad spot where it's going to get rained on by the, the Taliban or whatever up in the hills. Did, was there any sort of investigation, you know, after the fact about who, who set this up and didn't they realize what they were leading men to and did anybody get any, even a reprimand out of it? Um, the only investigation into the origin of the outpost was mine. Um, the Army investigation by General Swan uh, was limited to what happened in the few months leading up to the attack and during the attack, what could have been done. There were reprimands given, um, not um, all of them fair. Um, one of them, uh, I would say one of them was fair and the other three were not, I would say. Well, the colonel 
and the lieutenant colonel who were in charge of that area of operations had been trying to get permission from General McChrystal to shut down that outpost for uh, six or seven months. And McChrystal only finally gave the permission a few, a few weeks before, and they were in the process of shutting down the outpost when it got attacked. Uh, a captain who had taken over at the outpost literally a week or two before was reprimanded. Also, I don't think fair, uh, because they were shutting down the outpost. The captain before then, uh, I think that was fair. Uh, his name was Captain Mel Porter, um, and you can read about why I think it's fair. Um, in terms of why was the outpost put there, in 2006, uh, a decision was made, and keep, keep in mind, around that time, there were 20 times the number of troops in Iraq than there were in Afghanistan, 20 times. Um, and they were only then, in 2006, five years after this war began, starting to go to eastern Afghanistan, which is where bin Laden had lived, where bin Laden slipped through the cracks in Tora Bora, where the bad guys were coming, um, where I think something like eight out of the 10 medals of honor that have been given to Afghanistan, where eight of the 10 of them were, were earned in two provinces. Um, and the decision was made to set up a bunch of small outposts because they only had so many troops. Uh, and they, they needed, in that part of the world, you're either on a mountain or you're at the bottom of a mountain. And they wanted to be near the road because they were in charge of making sure that bad guys weren't using the road. And they were in charge of um, bonding with the local population and there was a town there. So I actually found the guy who, who picked the location, uh, Aaron Swain, um, who uh, you know I think feels bad about what happened three and a half years later. Um, there were discussions throughout the three and a half years of the outpost about moving it or closing it down, but there's something in Army thinking. And President Obama, do you remember when Obama came here in 2011 for the NATO summit about the future of Afghanistan? Yes. And I, you guys knew I was writing the book, and I asked, I forget if I asked you or, or Gibbs or Rhodes or maybe all, likely all three of you separately, yes. uh, if I could have permission to... Not telling any of us that you would ask <laughs> right. the other one. That I, would, that I was... Uh, um, I would like to ask a couple questions on behalf of soldiers. Um, and two of the soldiers in the book, I asked uh, their questions of President Obama, who was remarkably candid with his answers in a way that I'm convinced was because he thought he was talking to the soldiers and not to me. Um, and one of the answers was something that I found when researching this book, which is one of the things we love about the military is whatever you tell them to do, they will say, yes, we can do it. We will do it. Absolutely. Got it. We will do that. Um, but that incredibly admirable quality comes with a downside, which is there is a real reluctance to say that was a mistake or we should close down that outpost or we shouldn't be there or we should retreat. Not just a mistake, but there's a sense of dishonor that there's something wrong about it. Um, and I think that's part of what happened there. There's always a feeling of, well, we can just fortify the base a little bit more or do a couple more guard patrols and we'll be okay. Uh, related to David's question earlier, from your own experience, do you think for a reporter covering the policy aspects of a war, or for the top policymakers who are making military decisions on the, on the top level, should they be more exposed to these individual stories on the human level like you have? Or do you think it will be beneficial if they are actually shielded from the more human aspects of it? Thank you. It's a complicated question. I mean, I think, it, you know, the truth of the matter is that in order to make decisions in which you know people are going to die, um, whether it's for a colonel or a general or a president, um, those are decisions that require a certain degree of cold-bloodedness. And I don't mean that as a criticism, but people die in war, um, and you can't, you can't take a military action um, if, you're, if you're only thinking about the possible heartache that's gonna happen. If that had happened, we never would have entered World War II, for example, or we never would have um, engaged in the Balkan conflict. Um, and so I don't think it's healthy to be too focused on that, but I think it's very important to be aware of it and the pain uh, and the sacrifice. Um, so it's kind of a mealy-mouthed answer to your question. 
It should, you should be aware of it. it can't be, I don't think it can be your primary focus. But I think for people like President Obama, and I'm sure President Bush before him, and probably every president before them, uh, it, does, it does eat away at them, and they, they know. But Franklin Roosevelt could not have started World War II, uh, or, sorry, he could not have uh, entered the U.S. into World War II uh, if all he was thinking about was the tens of thousands of, of troops who were going to be killed. There's that great story, it's a horrifying story about Eisenhower as a general meeting a bunch of troops he knew were gonna be killed um, because they were about to, I think it was, I think it was uh, D-Day, yeah, and he was in a forest meeting them and um, he knew that most of them weren't gonna make it but they had to do it. Yes, right here in the front row. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> uh, when looking at kind of the role of media that it plays in covering warfare, do you think that, um, like as we get closer and closer to the future, as more and more stories come out about war, that that in and of itself will kind of change the role that media plays. Um, so basically what I'm asking is, can you kind of just place like an importance of like the primary purpose of political media? Should it be to tell these stories like you do that are kind of vo giving voice to the voiceless? Or should it be to report uh, what is already known or what might not, not be known in Washington? Um, or do you kind of think it should be to kind of report what's already happened? So kind of like, could you place an importance of the main role of media, well, political I'm, media. I don't, I don't know that I think that one is more important than the other. I think, I think it's our obligation to, to do all of that. I mean, obviously, we want to report on what people in power are saying, and, and, but also it, it is important to bring voice, voices to the voiceless, whether it's um, troops uh, or their families or um, people who are disenfranchised, people who are low income. Um, I know that there's a lot of concern right now about um, the SNAP program, funds to the SNAP program being cut. Uh, we haven't covered that on my show, and I, I really would like to. Um, um, we tried to do some of this during the government shutdown to show what, what it meant to people, but um, I, I just I don't think it's one or the other. Um, in terms of covering wars, uh, I think it's very important um, to uh, not believe everything the generals are telling you. That's my general Do you role. think the media has done a good job of covering the war in Afghanistan? No. I think that there have been some amazing reporters who have done amazing work, uh, not just in Afghanistan, but Iraq, and Libya, and Syria. Some of them have uh, paid for it with their lives. Um, I still can't believe uh, that Anthony Shadid's gone. Um, was such a powerful writer. Um, but uh, no, I don't think that the media writ large has done a great job, and I think one of the reasons is the war has gone on so long and the public is weary, uh, and they change the channel, or they don't buy the newspaper or the magazine. And I think that's regrettable. I think that's what happens when you have a war that seems, as you put it, so, so aptly, so remote. Not just physically remote, but so remote from their lives. Why are we still there? Uh, what does this, how does this affect me? Um, and I don't think, you know, I, I'm not one to call for policy prescriptions. I'm not one that would call for a, a tax or a return of the draft or, or a requirement of national service. But I just, I don't understand how it can continue this way. I don't, one general um, who is in the book, he didn't want to be quoted by name, but you'd know his name, uh, compared it to the Romans hiring legionnaires, just a completely different population. Uh, roped off from the rest of us. I just don't see how it continues. So I don't think we've done an adequate job, the media writ large, but it's not just the media's fault. Yeah, no, I agree. Well, we're going to have, I think that uh, the, that weariness is translating into a very, very strong sense of uh, isolationism. So anyone who wants to make the case in the future is going to have to find a way to sell it to a broader a broader populace. Yes, yes, that young lady there. Um, thank you so much. So when you, you said that when you started to interview people and call the soldiers, that they were very eager to share their stories. And I think something we all think about is, you know, everyone has a story to share. And at least I always think, like, if we all know each other's stories, like, we'd all be happy and hold hands and it'd be a better world. And I think to a certain extent, though, that's true. And so I'm wondering, you mentioned the 500,000 people who are coming back with you know, post-traumatic stress. Do you think it will help them to have some type of platform to share their stories that is not just you know, people writing books or the media reporting on their stories? 
And if so, if you think that will help, have you envisioned something that would allow them to share stories in a more like, broader, interconnected way? Wow, that's a great question. I, you know, I never know what to say about when people ask me about what to do about the, the people that, with these wounds, uh, these m mental and psychological wounds. Um, you know, 500,000, by the way, they're not, they're here, they're back. They're not coming back, they're back. There are more people in this country right now walking the streets, fighting these wars, these tiny wars in their heads, uh, than there are troops in Afghanistan right now, with about 52 or 53,000 US troops. So they're here. I don't know, I mean, they don't want to be, they don't want to be animals at the zoo, you know, they don't want to be on display. I, 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 I don't know what we need to do. Um, I just know that it's a problem that we're going to have to face and policymakers are going to have to address it. My mom was a psychiatric nurse uh, at the Veterans Hospital in Philadelphia, so I don't begrudge the VA system at all. I know these are people who work hard and they're underpaid and understaffed, but the VA hospital's not enough. It's just not, the current system isn't. And I worry about in this current, climate of budget cutting, uh, what that's just gonna mean for, for these people who did this for us, uh, who are vul very vulnerable and who need help. Um, I don't know. This is I, another price of the remoteness of the war. We all are excited to cheer these folks at baseball games and football games, but it's gonna take more than that. And uh, I wish there was a way to just like, you know, you require every psychiatrist and psychologist and, and social worker to like, uh, you know, see five patients who are veterans. I mean, I wish there was a way to do that. And you know, by the way, it's not just veterans too. It's, it's, it's the spouses, uh, it's the widows and the widowers and the moms who, who uh, I mean, I know a soldier friend of mine was, all, he had to get off Facebook uh, for a while because uh, the, one of the grieving moms um, who would go to Facebook every week or two and, and pour out her heart to her son in a Facebook posting that we all could see. It just, um, he had sent him, he had sent that soldier out to deliver ammunition, and he was killed uh, just a few feet outside the barracks, and it just tore him apart. Um, so it's not just the soldiers it's, and the survivors, it's, it's, uh, it's their parents, too, and their wives and their kids. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here this evening. Um, so you have, you know, Omaha Beach, Chosen Reservoir, Tet Offensive, Fallujah One. Is this going to be the, you know, battle that gets remembered in Afghanistan? Um, do you think that it should be the battle that gets remembered because it sort of seems to be an example of um, mismanagement, maybe, and sort of a mismanagement of the war can be a greater metaphor. What do you think that this will represent five years from now? It's tough to, it's a great question. It's tough to know what the appropriate metaphor war, metaphor battle will be because the, the, you know, the history of Afghanistan is not over yet. We still don't know. We still have 52, 53,000 troops there. We still don't know how many troops are going to be, <clears throat> be in Afghanistan after December 2014. Um, I suspect it will be, there will be some small amount uh, counterterrorism forces, uh, but I don't know. I mean, I know that they're having a hell of a time with Karzai, as they always do. Um, so... I don't know. I mean, I, to me, it's it, to me it, it serves as a way of understanding Afghanistan, because you you um, you understand why we were there. You understand the point of it, um, and you see some very brave people um, trying their best. Some decisions that aren't so great, uh, and then ultimately we leave. And I think there's a question of well, what did we leave behind? Um, I don't I don't know that it's an appropriate. Um, symbol of Afghanistan or not. Uh, I know that it, it, you know, it meant a lot to me to cover it and to, to record it. Um, I hope it's not a metaphor for the, for the war, for the overall war. Yes, in the back there. Thank you. Um, you have a lot of new freedoms uh, being on a 24-hour news network at CNN, uh, but are there aspects of ABC or This Week that you miss um, being an institutional platform since David Brinkley hosted it in the 80s and 90s? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I loved my time at ABC News. Um, it was a great experience, and I, you know, I worked my way from the bottom, from not being able to get on air at all to being senior White House correspondent. I went to CNN because I wanted to be an anchor. I mean, that was just the next step in my evolution as a journalist. Um, and I wanted to have my own show and have more say 
and be on for more than 15 seconds at the beginning of my piece and 15 seconds at the end of my piece. Um, yeah, there are things, there are things I, I miss about ABC. I mean, the networks have bigger audiences. I mean, that's always nice uh, to, to be reaching more people uh, at, you know, in, in one hit. But by the same token, I, I feel like um, the aggregate of being on longer and every day on my own show ultimately means uh, a bigger audience. Um, and also, it's so uh, meaningful for me to be able to be in charge and say, no, you know what, I really thought the interview with Mayor Emanuel was good, let's give it two blocks. And uh, they have to do what I say. <laughs> Which is, no, they Ram, don't really... <laughs> Ram, Ram was applauding that too. Uh, questions on well, this side it. of the he's room? The, he's the one that did it. Yeah. Yes, in the back there. In light of your comments about politics um, in Washington, and then connecting that to the current functionality in the votes of Congress, with the budget conference process that's underway now, do you have any kind of a gut feeling of how the makeup of the budget conferees will approach veterans' um, benefits and, you know, with sequester cuts that are currently underway and on the table for next year? Just this whole budget process now, given that quite a few, and anybody involved, hasn't been directly associated with war? If you, if you were a gambling guy, well, if you're a gambler, you can never go broke underestimating Congress. Um, Rom had some really interesting, uh, I'm sorry, Mayor Emanuel had some really interesting uh, points. Everybody here calls him Rom. Okay, good. Uh, about uh, the dysfunction of Washington, D.C. right now. He actually started criticizing during the interview on camera. Uh, uh, the redistricting process, mm -hmm. and he, he said that as a former practitioner of the dark arts yes. of redistricting, um, this is probably old hat to you guys because you probably hear from Ram every week uh, with David here. But but uh, I just thought it was really interesting. He talked about instead of um, districts picking congressmen, congressmen now pick districts, and when you have the most competitive elections being taking place in the primaries, you warp the whole system. And that was really interesting uh, to me. I, I, I didn't disagree with it, but it was just to hear that he was a practitioner of that dark arts uh, back when he headed the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. Um, look, I, I think that Patty Murray and uh, Paul Ryan and Angus King are, and, and some of the others are, are serious legislators. Um, I, I, don't, uh, I, I don't really, to be completely frank, I, I've been focused on the government shutdown. And then I came out here, and I haven't done a ton of reporting about the budget conference yet, so I, I don't, I don't have a feel yet. Yeah, well, I think they're just starting and Not trying to figure out. Report, yeah. yeah, yeah, starting to figure out the parameters. Um, you know, Nancy Pelosi said uh, today that there won't be any deal unless there's some sort of tax increase, and we've heard the opposite from uh, members of Congress uh, on the Republican side. So. Uh, I don't. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I can say that I think Rom's onto something when he says um, that the system, both on the left and the right, uh, um, uh, and I don't. I'm not. Try not trying to engage in false equivalence, um, but I, I think, David, you would agree that uh, when President Obama set up the Bowles Simpson Commission, uh, which was supposed to, you know, that was the last blue ribbon commission to try to come up with a, a path forward on the deficit and the debt. Um, and it didn't get the majority, it didn't get the, uh, I guess, it, I mean, it, it didn't, it got a majority, but, but it, it didn't, didn't get the majority. didn't get the two thirds or whatever right. it needed, or the three quarters. Um, you know, there were Democrats and Republicans, including Paul Ryan, who voted against it. And, and that really felt, um, what was 2010, was it? 2000, it, it, it really felt, it filled me with uh, discomfort because I know um, the, the ugliness of, of, uh, if nothing happens, um, and uh, what that's going to mean for you know my son Jack, uh, who's now four, and when he's 40, uh, what the debt burden is going to be on him. So um, I don't have a lot of optimism, but I'm paid to be a skeptic. So don't pay any attention to me. Um, any yes, right there. I want everybody else to hear you too. <laughs> Hi, thanks so much for coming. Um, I'm actually a budding journalist, so I'm always appreciate, I always appreciate people like you coming to talk about your work. And I had a question about 
um, what motivates you when you find a story that's relatively untold like this one? What makes you think this is the one I'm going to cover and this is the one I'm going to invest my time in? Well, I mean, like I said earlier, I mean, I think I just felt this, an enormous sense of responsibility to tell these people's stories, and not just the stories of the soldiers, but their their um, their husbands and wives and, and mothers and fathers and children uh, as well, um, just because they, they, they weren't, these stories weren't being told, and I had not been telling them, uh, even though I had a, a perch uh, from which to do so. Um, in general, um, what motivates me more than anything is when I'm, I'm breaking, just me personally, is when I'm breaking a story, when there's some information that people don't have and I'm providing it, especially if it like contradicts you know, the common, a common thread out there. That's always fun. Uh, I was kind of, kind of grimacing when he was going through the stories that I broke from the White House that I won the awards for because they were all stories that I'm sure they hated. Uh, Although they, I'm sure Tom Daschle's relieved that you didn't, uh, you made it possible for him not to get that job at HHS. <laughs> right, right, right now Tom Daschle's yeah. sending me a muffin basket. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, the tax burden or the standard and poor's or uh, Dennis Blair about to be fired. That was the third one. I'm like the grim, grim reaper when I show up. I have some bad. I have some news. Yes, I'm gonna have some news. I'm about happy to break. When you're, uh, when you're writing about Afghanistan. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, yes, sir. Um, on behalf of some of the other younger uh, journalists, um, I'm curious about your book writing process. You said that initially the book would be about the battle, and then it broadened. Um, and I think some of the young journalists in the audience would love to hear about how your reporting process and how you came up with a structure that worked. I, I ultimately um, let the reporting um, speak, you know, di dictate what what I decided, um, and, and you know, the the it's, the book is divided into third into third into three parts. It's in thirds, and the first part is the group that goes there and sets up the camp. Um, the second part condenses uh, two different companies and you know two and a half years uh, or two years or so. Uh, and then the third part is is the last group that's there. So it's not, there's no equal time. Um, I, I was lucky in that there was a sort of narrative arc uh, that existed in, in the sense of they come and they set up, things go horribly, things start going really well, then there is a transformative, horrendous event and everything goes to pot. Uh, and that, that just happened to be a narrative arc that that existed uh, and I kind of structured the book around it, um, just as one would structure any nonfiction, fiction, or screenplay. Um, but uh, in terms of the process, it was interview as many people as I can, uh, as much as you know, as much as possible, uh, and then organize all of their information, figure out what stories are the most important, and and uh, and everything else would have to be cut, and. It's uh, the "Killing Your da Darlings" line by Faulkner is is uh, apropos. It was it was painful, um, you know, to interview a soldier who had a very compelling story, but it actually just wasn't that important at the end of the day uh, because he survived, or because it really wasn't that important to the development of the dynamic of what was going on in the valley at that point. Uh, and that those were painful decisions by me and also by my uh, my editor, but ultimately. It already was a you know 500 plus page book, um, and we wanted people to read it. And if it was 10 volumes, uh, nobody was going to pick it up or publish it. I have a last question here. Uh, yes, right there. No, you. Yes. I'll just talk. Uh, how do you place the, this particular battle into the historical context of the disaster experienced by British and Russian? Well, you'll be happy to hear. Actually, there's a lot in there about. There's a lot in the book about. Um, I mean, the whole first book uh, has a, a Greek theme running through it, um, uh, and about Alexander the Great and there, there are times there. I mean, the the Nuristan province, which is where this takes place. Um, is historically 
a, a rough place for, for outsiders. Um, I don't know how many of you ever saw the movie with Michael Caine and Sean Connery or read the novella by uh, Rudyard Kipling, but The Man Who Would Be King takes place in Nuristan province. It is, it was the last province, uh, the last one to convert to Islam uh, of all of Afghanistan, which they only did in the 19th century, uh, and the first one to take up arms against the Soviets in 1979. They don't like outsiders. So they're, they're there were plenty of historical allusions, um, including the fact that there were um, three uh, hollowed out uh, Soviet personnel carriers outside combat outpost Keating. Uh, if you ever want to know of a place not to set up a camp, uh, it's where there are the remnants of the empire who came before you uh, uh, left behind. So um, there are plenty of uh, historical allusions uh, like that. Well, I. Uh Jake uh, mentioned that he has two small children. We want to make sure that he gets out of here tonight because tomorrow is Halloween. Um, so, and I want to just say that uh, as we await the arrival of Anchorman 2, <laughs> it's nice to have an Anchorman here who is really a superior journalist and a serious journalist and someone who uh, has, uh, I think, the, the uh, essence of good journalism is exposing people to things they otherwise wouldn't know and should. And uh, Jake... Uh, has done that on this and other things, and uh, uh, and we're we're really honored to have you here today. Uh, it's a, a real honor to be here, and thank you so much. You've been a great, great audience. I think I'm gonna, I think I probably have time to sign a couple books out there. Uh, yes, I should have mentioned that. I'm sorry. Uh, there are books out there. So the uh, author is here. <laughs> it's a perfect combination. I'm happy to sign them. So, uh, and if uh, and if you did if you had a question and you get a, didn't get a chance, uh, I, I I'm happy to briefly entertain those questions. Thank you so much.